Today, I'd like to talk about using power inverters during a power outage. When you live in a place like I do, that routinely loses power for half a day every couple months, you really don't want to take the time to set up the generator for such a short power outage. This is where inverters come into play. An inverter can create standard household AC voltages by using a battery as a power source. They are actually very quick and easy to use. For opening and closing the garage door, I have a somewhat permanent setup. It consists of the inverter, a deep cycle battery. Deep cycle is a different construction method than automotive batteries. They're actually designed for inverter use. To learn more about deep cycle versus automotive, click the link above to go to some of my other videos. And a cautionary note when you're using a battery like this, insulate the terminals. If something conductive were to touch exposed terminals, there would be arcing and a potential for fire. We have a battery tender to keep the battery charged and maintained. If you desired, you could charge using alternate methods, such as solar, wind, or hydropower. Or if you live near a volcano, use geothermal. Finally, there's an easy-to-access extension cord hidden behind this garage door track. The other end of the extension cord is stowed next to the garage door power plug. Now, the next time you have a power outage, plug your extension cord into your garage door opener plug. Gain access to your inverter. Grab the other end of the extension cord and plug it into the inverter. Turn the inverter on and hit your garage door opener. Total setup time, less than 30 seconds. Considerably quicker than dragging out your generator and hooking it up. While in operation, notice the meter on the left side of the inverter. It shows how many watts is being pulled out of it. This is actually some very important information, and here's why. Each inverter is designed with a maximum output in watts. You cannot draw more current from the inverter than it's rated for. So, when selecting your inverter, you have to know in advance how many watts the item you're powering uses. They have tables out there like this one to help you make this decision. And here's how to read it. The inverter I've shown in this video is 1200 watts. Draw a line straight across from the top of the bar. And generally speaking, everything that's under that bar can be powered by that inverter. Something to think about while making your selection is the first item on this list, a chest freezer. You can easily have thousands of dollars of food stored in a chest freezer, all of which will spoil during a long power outage. So as long as you don't open the chest freezer, use your inverter for a couple hours a day, and the freezer temperatures will stay low enough to keep your food good. Speaking of freezers, let's take a quick sidebar. Any device that it's critical that you keep power going to it should have a device like this installed on it. This monitors the power going into the appliance. If power should be lost, an extremely loud alarm will be triggered. If you don't hear it, your neighbors will. The table we just talked about works, but there is actually a more accurate way of figuring this stuff out. Purchase a piece of test equipment like this. This is a kilowatt meter. Plug it into the outlet, plug your appliance into the meter, and the meter will tell you how many watts the appliance is pulling. The neat thing about this is, if you just leave it plugged in for a month, it will tell you how many kilowatts of power that appliance used that month. Look at your electric bill to see how much they charge per kilowatt. You now know how much it costs to run that appliance for a month. Anyway, let's use that meter to figure out how big an inverter I need to drive my garage door opener. While the garage door is being pulled open, I need 524 watts. So, for this garage door opener, you could use the smallest inverter on this table. Now that you've selected your inverter, we want to be smart about how we use it. Remember, your power source is a battery. There's a limited amount of energy in there, so you don't want to waste any of it. My meter says the garage door opener is pulling 77 watts when it's not moving the door. The reason is because the light is on. During a power outage, remove the light bulbs. This will lengthen the amount of time your inverter can run off of one battery. Also, inverters pull power from a battery even when you're not operating an appliance. So leave them turned off unless you're actually using them. Another thing you can do is create yourself a portable 60 Hz power supply. It has a 300 watt inverter, a battery charging system, as well as a battery. Click on the link above to see the video on how I built this. I use this as the power source for my laptop as I'm making these videos in my car during lunches and breaks at work. During a power outage, if you should happen to have a natural gas fireplace, the fire does not require electricity, but the fan does. The fan requires 60 watts to operate. Bring your portable power supply inside, plug the fireplace fan into it. Now you have heat. Another quick side note. If you have a natural gas hot water heater, it also does not require electricity to operate. So you can take hot showers during a power outage. I've also found it's very convenient to have a spare 600 watt inverter. 
This is because it can handle many of the small power tools you may have to operate during an emergency power outage. Now the wires going to the battery need to be pretty large. This is because you're pulling a lot of current and small wires would melt or catch fire. And placing clamps on the wiring makes this inverter extremely portable. Before I finish up, let me quickly touch on two more items. The first is, how long should your battery last? Deep cycle batteries will usually have a capacity rating marked on them, and it will be in amp hours. So it's easy to assume I could get 77 amp hours out of this battery. Now I know as soon as I use the word assume, everyone out there is waiting for me to tell you why you can't assume this. Here's a table showing a battery charge broken down into 10% increments. You can actually measure the percent of charge left in your battery by looking at the voltage of the battery terminals. So I have three colors, green, yellow, and red. Just like people, batteries don't like to be worked too hard. So the green is showing you that you can use up to 30% of the charge of that battery, and the battery won't care. You just recharge it and press on. Staying in the green range will give you a maximum life cycle on the battery. Now, if you start draining the battery down to the yellow band, you're starting to do some minor damage on the inside of the battery. This will shorten the lifespan of the battery. And finally, the red band, you pull 77 amps out of it, you're physically damaging the battery. Do this often enough, you'll be buying a new battery. Now, let's say the power outage lasts longer than you expected. Is there any way for you to recharge the battery if you don't have any of the alternative charging methods I mentioned earlier? The answer is yes, if you've planned ahead. Let me introduce to you a term called BCI group size. See the link above where I describe this in detail in another video. But in short, what it means is, how is the battery physically constructed? For example, battery dimensions and configuration of the electrical posts. This is important because every battery in the same group size anywhere in the world is compatible with every piece of equipment that's designed to use that group size. So if I buy a deep cell battery with the same group size as, say, my car, when it comes time to recharge that battery, I swap out the deep cell with the automotive battery, and assuming it's not discharged too far, it will actually start the car. Now I can use the alternator in the car to recharge my deep cell. But remember, this takes planning ahead, and no buying a new car after you've bought your deep cell battery. The last thing I'd like to talk about is audio systems. You can see by this chart, they claim you can use an inverter to drive a home stereo system. Well, the truth about that is, well, yes and no. Depends on how much you paid for your inverter. The electricity that comes out of your wall looks like this. It's a pure sine wave without any sharp changes in the voltage or current. Now, the more expensive inverters can actually reproduce this sine wave. So your audio equipment will work just fine. However, your cheaper inverters don't produce a sine wave. They produce something called a modified sine wave. Instead of the voltage and current flowing smoothly, it jumps. Now, every place where you see a sharp change, electrical interference is generated. And you can hear the interference over an audio circuit. It sounds like this. Unfortunately, since I use an inverter while I'm making my videos, I have forgotten to turn the inverter off while doing the audio. And you can hear that hum in the background. So the quality of the inverter makes a big difference. And I apologize to any subscriber that had to listen to it. Well, that's about it. I hope I've given you enough information to make your next power outage much more enjoyable than playing solitary by candlelight.